and those of you who have attended some of our earlier events over the last three years would perhaps be aware and recall that we like to cast off on time. So we've had occasions when our speakers have been detailed by traffic and we've done a very postmodern thing that we formally call the house to order that. <laughs> but thank you very much everyone for being here. Before I formally welcome and introduce our speaker and the subject, can I request all of you to put your phones in silence? And these days some of you may have new phones and you may not know how to put it on silent. <laughs> so please look right, look left, one of yours. Neighbors may be a little wiser than you. And the second request, which is for those who are who spend more time in cyber, this is a reflective lecture. So you do not have to tweet. If you want to make notes, by all means, use your phones or your iPads. But uh, I just wanted to say that I've gone for conferences and events where everyone's furiously tweeting away in their beeps and we don't need them. The last request is for our friends from the media, particularly those who are here with cameras, still and otherwise. Please stay near your camera. And to our still photographers, please take a few pictures and do not uh, disrupt the rhythm of the lecture. So I'm sorry for making so many administrative announcements, but on that note, some yes, sir? I wanted to first of all welcome all of you on behalf of the India Habitat Center. And as I often do, I thank the IHC and Today, allow me to thank the director, the new director, Mr. Sunit Tandon. He a big hand to him. He's just taken over. He refused to come here, so he's a modest man. But as always, I wanted to thank the Habitat for enabling this lecture series, which, again, some of you who have been with us over the last few years may recall. It's about three years old now. In 2015, we started this. And in the course of our own internal meetings between the Habitat Center and the Society for Policy Studies, there was a very useful thought given by the former director, Mr. Bakkar, I'm not sure Rakesh here, I'm not seeing that we thought we cast it as part of the changes taking place in Asia. So we had a number of themes. We were looking at international relations, we were looking at security issues, we were looking at global issues, we looked at health, education, basically to get a sense about some of the big ticket items if you will, and also see whether we could have a forum and that's really the genesis of this whole lecture series and since I see so many new faces, I'm taking the liberty of repeating what we've said in the past that the origin of this lecture series that the Habitat and the SPS have put together was really to try and provide a platform, a forum, saying that in this day of information overload, data overload, social media overwhelmingly in our lives, that there was perhaps a need to have a platform, a forum where occasionally civil society could meet and ponder over, reflect over some of the bigger issues and try and maybe just think about how these impact us and what is it that the citizen or civil society could possibly bring to the table. And actually it's been relatively empty. I don't think we brought very much to the table. But we've had occasion to, I think, think aloud about a number of issues. And it's as an extension of that series, that today's lecture, I want to thank all of you for being here because today Delhi is having a number of events. Those of you who are familiar with the other institutions in Delhi that have similar events, there's a lot of activity, there are talks, there's music, there's film, and notwithstanding all of that, the fact that you're here is, I thank you all that. I see some of our earlier members of the Habitat and the SPS who have come from long distances to be with us this evening. I'm very glad you're here. And I also want to welcome members of the Diplomatic Corps. The Ambassador Venezuela is here. I hope he 
also speak in this platform at some point, members of the media and those who have come from within the government and other institutions in Delhi, thank you for being with us. Today's speaker needs no introduction. There you are. <laughs> so Mr. Sitaram Yeshuri is a uh, very, very, as I said, well-known face. So on that note, maybe I won't introduce him. <laughs> I'll take a couple of minutes if I may and talk about the subject if I could take that liberty. Which is, as you can see there, those of you who got the invite, you know, we were looking at the relevance of Marxism in India and Asia. And I want to share a little aside, if I may, that these subjects and speakers are normally agreed upon a few months in advance. And May is a very happening month in the Indian calendar. <laughs> now, I'm what is called a security mala, if you know what I mean. I spend a lot of time in the security think tank. And I worked very closely with a gentleman who used to be called Bomb Mama. This is the late Mr. K. Subramanian when in the ideas. And again, I'm sure many in this audience would be aware that day after tomorrow, the 11th of May, is the 20th anniversary of the Shakti test, Pokhara 2. And so there was a lot of triangulation saying that what is it that we should do in May. We had not expected that President Donald Trump would walk out of the deal with Iran. So we were wondering, but at that time, some of the wise heads in the council said that you know, there's Karl Marx and there's his 200th birthday. So should we? So after much sort of deliberation, we said, you know, a bad idea, we should do it. And we framed it in a way that would be appropriate for Delhi, for this audience. And the aside I wanted to share was that about a couple of weeks ago, we put out the invites on cyber. So the Habitat and the SPS have a very active cyber team, so we had the invitations out there. And the first response came from well wishers in the United States of America. <laughs> and the lighter main quip was, what's happening in Delhi? You guys still holding a candle for Karl Marx? And then there were even more witty remarks which came up on other forms of social media saying that relevance, please change the title to irrelevance. So, you know, this kind of banter went on. But I just wanted to say, and I'm saying this for the benefit of our younger members who are here, because I think this audience is roughly divided into one cross-section that could be described as those who have more yesterdays than tomorrows. Both Sita and I are definitely on part of that, so are many others here. But there are a lot of younger people here and I just wanted to share with you and say that in our younger days, we were all young at one time. In our 20s, you know, Karl Marx was a big deal. And I was saying to one of my friends, Sanjeev, as we were walking in now, that we went through a phase and then it seemed that all this was irrelevant. We saw the excesses that took place in the Soviet Union, in Communist China and elsewhere. Millions died in the name of Marx, Marxism as it transmuted into distortions politically at different points in time. But today, in this phase of our life, in the autumn of our life, definitely, I think there is definitely a need to recall Marx for what he was. And if I could just briefly, you know, I've been reading my own, doing my homework on Marx for the 200th anniversary. So you were in UK, right, for the event. So he was in UK, he just come back. But I think here there are two, three, four aspects, and I'm saying this really not for the Marxist scholars who are here who may take to what Marx, but for our younger friends here. That today, when I look at Marx and people say, what is it about Karl Marx? And I kept saying that it's a bit like the blind men and the elephant. That you can approach Karl Marx from any which way. You know, was he only a economist? Was he a sociologist? Was he a political philosopher? Was he a humanist? Or was he quote unquote evil? because he represented everything that happened. And I've heard some very extreme views about people who have described what Marx meant to them. And I say that perhaps in 2018, the one aspect about Marx that we might want to ponder over, and I'm sure that our speaker will walk us through this, is that amongst the many things that Karl Marx highlighted in his writings, and they were copious by the way, for those of you who are not aware, I came across a nugget that is two very famous, the pamphlet, Communist Manifesto and Das Kapital on Capital, the Economics, Tom, Volume 1, which is available in many languages. I just saw a very scholarly article by a French professor who said that the preparatory notes for Volume 1, later seen by Hegel, run into 24,000 pages. 
That's notes to volume one. And they say, the scholars who work on Marx say that they have not adequately mined all the papers, notebooks that he had filled at different points in time. But I think if there's one particular strand that at least I found very relevant, and there's a certain resonance in 2018, is this whole question of oppression, the exploitation of the worker. And the fact that today we have a situation where globally it is said repeatedly, the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer, the powerful are becoming more powerful, and the vulnerable are getting more and more, shall we say, oppressed. And I think for India, this is one statistic again I'm taking the liberty of sharing, that today according to various global estimates, India is amongst the most inequitous, unequal societies in the world. And we share this particular slot with China, the last of the major communist countries where there is a lot of number crunching. In the Indian context, it is said that 1% of India, the super, super rich, own 53% of national wealth. And there is a very interesting word, inequality index, that talks about the rate of accretion of wealth and how Indian and Chinese societies at the very top are not competing with Russia for this so-called super rich. But this I thought is something that we as the largest democracy in the world, and to the extent that civil society is here today, need to think about this. And it's in that sense where a lot of people say it's very fashionable to say that Marxism is irrelevant, communism is irrelevant. We are looking at this maybe in terms of, in a more, as I said, reflective manner this evening. And there was no better person than Mr. Sitaram Yachuri currently the General Secretary of the to walk us through this. And very briefly, ma'am, I'll introduce him despite the fact that all of you know him, that Mr. Yechuri is currently known as the face of the CPIM in Indian politics. But he's also had a very interesting, I would say, career before he reached this particular point. And, I, sorry, I went to his CV in some detail and came across a couple of minor sort of bits which I thought I might share with you that he, as a young student, has a record of having been, he was all India first in what was called as the HSC and the equivalent of the CBSC, and I clarified it then before we came in, that we used to have what is called as the PUC in the old days. You know, there was something called matriculation and then the PUC. And he moved to Delhi for personal reasons. And he has a very interesting little sort of association he finished his school from the President's School, right sir? Estate school. Estate school. And then from there he did his undergrad in St. Stephen's and went to JD. <coughs> and I made the mistake once of saying that this is the Mafia. You know that you have Stephen's and JD as the equivalent of the Mafia in Delhi. And I was corrected by my late friend Appan Menon, some of you may know him, who said no, that's the wrong combination. It has to be Hindu at JD. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to get into that. But to say that he has had a very, very distinguished academic career, I've heard this being said by his friends, that it's been lost for academia that he chose to join politics as a full-time member of the Communist Party. And as I said over the years, he's made a very distinguished, not distinguished, but distinctive contribution to debates in parliament. And he's written extensively. I'm very happy to report to you that just last year, our former vice president, Mr. Ahmed Ansari, had released two volumes of Mr. Yechuri's speeches in Parliament. And again, for our younger students, those of you who want to get a sense about does Parliament do anything, I think you could look at Mr. Yechuri's speeches and get a sense about what Parliament does when it actually gets down to thinking about these issues. So we've requested him to talk to us about this particular issue, which is the relevance of Marxism in India and, of course, by extension, Asia, given the fact that four of the five communist states in the world are here in Asia. In China, Vietnam, Laos, and North Korea. But of course in India, I will not deliberate upon the contribution of the left parties. I leave that to Mr. Yechu. On that note, sir, may I invite you. And again, I request all of you, those who come later, please switch your phones off. We do not want to Thank you, thank you very much, Comrade Devas. And thank you, Society for Policy Studies and the India Habitat Center, who's hosting this lecture, and all my friends.
comrades, if you don't mind my addressing you that. And I notice in the audience also some of the distinguished uh, professors who taught me in uh, JNU economics. And uh, I'm glad, I'm very honored that they are also present here. Well, after the introduction, flattering as well as uh, with the comments on what Marxism ought to be and what is the relevance or irrelevance of Marxism that Comrade Devaskar had just made. I thought I'll just reverse. I mean, he said that I need no introduction. I mean, that could also be that notorious people also don't need introductions. <laughs> so, so we could. I, but I don't take it in that sense. But nevertheless, thank you very much for those flattering remarks. And after listening to Comrade Devaskar, I thought I'll just reverse the order of what I wanted to speak about. Well, I thought I'll end with saying that what is my understanding or what is the Communist Party of India Marxist understanding, how we internalized what is Marxism all about. But let me begin by that in order to say that to establish the relevance of Marxism today, we are, as the Comrade Uday uh, Bhaskar said, in the week that is being observed the world over as Marx 200. The Twitter has officially put out saying that this is the number one global trending in the world today. And you had, I mean, sort of in the New York Times come out with a heading saying, Happy Birthday, Karl Marx. You were right. You know, that, that was its banner head, uh, headline. And then you have uh, people like uh, Amartya Sen, the Nobel laureate, who, who tells you that paying attention to Marx is more important than paying respect to Marx. Now, why this attention to Marx? Marx. I mean, and then you have the New York Times very approvingly quoting one paragraph from the Communist Manifesto, which runs as follows. It says, it says quote, the bourgeoisie has stripped of its halo every occupation hitherto honored and looked upon with reverent awe. It has converted the physician, the lawyer, the priest, the poet, the man of science into its paid wage laborers." Unquote. <coughs> the sort of inequalities that Commodore just described today is virtually seeing this process <laughs> unfolding in a very vicious manner in today's world. I'll get into that point later. But when Xi Jinping, we are talking of relevance of Marxism in Asia and in India, come to India a little later, when G, uh, Xi Jinping talks of Marxism, he says that uh, Marx's 200th birthday, he was speaking and what he said was that China is a cast iron proof of the success of Marxism. And he says without, uh, the, the sick man of Asia is now today the second most powerful economic power in the world. He said this would not have been possible without Marxism and it's adaptation to these Chinese conditions, what they call socialism with Chinese characteristics. So eventually what thinking about Marx, what Amartya Sen said, is essentially to realize one important aspect which I think in today's world is very important for all of us to grapple. And Asia and India being part of the world today, we cannot dis disassociate with what is happening elsewhere. It is essentially a battle of ideas. Marxism is basically a battle of ideas, so it is not only economics, it is not only purely in terms of economic theory or sociological interpretation or the Marxist influence in arts and literature or Marxist influence in the development of science and giving a historical you know, basis for the development of science or the fact that every single Every single advance in frontier technologies that you find today, from astrophysics to nanotechnology, today actually resoundingly vindicates the dialectical materialist method of Marxism. So when we come to the concrete conditions of how uh, they have to be changed, that is one aspect of Marxism. But in the larger context, the understanding of Marxism has to be, I think, in the realm of ideas, in the realm of the battle of ideas, and why I would say, I'll, when, when I come to conclusion of some of my remarks, I'll just uh, try to illustrate it with, with how this battle is taking place in specific context of India. Now, I, that I'll come to, but what do 
at least in our party, or we understand, or the Indian Marxists understand about Marxism. It is open to a lot of interpretations, but essentially, I believe that Marxism is unique in the sense that it can be transcended only when its agenda is realized, the agenda of realizing a classless communist social order. Specifically under capitalism, Marxism's understanding is alone thorough enough to comprehend the historical possibilities that lie beyond capitalism. Hence, cap Marxism can never be, under capitalism, rendered superfluous until capitalism itself is rendered superfluous. Why I say this is whether we should revisit Marx today, whether we should rediscover Marx today, or there's something that Marx had said we have not understood, therefore we got to go back to his writings. That, that until capitalism itself is superseded, Marxism as it stands today, I believe, cannot be superseded. Post-capitalism, of course. It will remain a philosophical outlook that will guide the movement of society towards the classless society that Marx was talking about. The essence of this is what? That Marxism is not a dogma. It's not dogmatic, it's not a formula. It is not something that has to be mechanically applied. It is a creative science. And the creative science is based, among other things, on what was described as a concrete analysis of concrete conditions. As conditions change, if your analysis does not change, in my opinion, you are not a Marxist. That analysis has to change on the basis of certain postulates, of course, but the adaptation to the changing conditions, and that precisely is what is the success of China today, that precisely is what is a different, entirely different trajectory in Vietnam today, or in Cuba today, that to those concrete conditions that obtain in every country, how is this applied? And therefore Marxism is an approach to the analysis of history in general and of capitalism in particular. It is on this basis, building on the foundations provided by Marx, that we continuously enrich our theory. Failure to enrich your theory is not because of lapses or inadequacies in Marx or Marxism. They are inadequacies in others who call ourselves Marxists, that if we are not able to adapt ourselves and properly understand the changing conditions, and this, I think, is important to understanding the present conjecture in the world, in Asia and in India, and the possibilities that it holds for the future. So therefore, far from being a closed theoretical system, Marxism is a continuous theoretical enrichment. And that is something we must understand that as a creative science, it's capable of identifying the tendencies and developments of human civilization. The human nature dialectic is something that happens independent of each one of us and something that happens continuously. And there's no, none of us who can actually stop that process from happening. And as this dialectic under, under, unfolds, you have technology come in, intervening in order to I mean in order to control, in order to correct, in order to utilize nature for human development and human civilizational advance. And that is why I think the dialectical materialist method is able to anticipate many, many developments that are continuously taking place and I think Marxism, those who connected with Marxism and science will be able to explain that much better as we are all being threatened to be taken over by artificial intelligence soon. And, and it is Marxism that, that is actually able to tell you that it is because of this human nature dialectic that is a continuous process and a never-ending process as long as human beings exist. This technology, technological developments that keep intervening, how that itself becomes a material force leading the development of human civilization advance and this sort of an anticipation of what is likely to happen that Marxism provides. So therefore, I would, to those cyber tweets that you got, uh, Commodore, I would only like to say that far from being irrelevant, I think the current situation resoundingly vindicates the truth of 
the essence of Marxism and its practice. And why is it globally today that Marxism is being revived, received, read about, including the venerable Pope in the Vatican, ordering copies of the Das Capital to understand why this Catholic crisis is continuing even after a decade. It's a decade now since the Wall Street financial institutions collapsed. Every single method was tried out. Why, in a, in a nutshell, from the Marxist point of view, understand why this crisis emanated? What is now called as neoliberalism? How do you define neoliberalism? It is the creation of new avenues, new products, new methods for continuous profit maximization. Financial liberalization, all sorts of liberalization that you talk of, which are now today brought into the theoretical framework of neoliberalism, was to pave the way post Soviet Union's collapse, post no threat to capitalist order in the world, to create a world economy whereby there are no barriers or no limits to the levels of profit expansion. Profit maximization being the result the head of neoliberalism created a situation where the global inequalities the comrade was talking about where majority of the world's population did not have enough purchasing power to buy the products that were being produced by capitalism itself. And what Marx taught us, amongst many other things, if a product that is produced is not sold, neither profit is made nor the economy will grow. How do you get out of this crisis? Give people cheap credit, the subprime credit crisis. Give them credit, let them spend from the credit. They will spend, we will continue to make our profits and the system will continue. But when the time came for returning the credit, when that was not returned, not one bank, but the whole financial system broke down because they were all intertwined into creating financial commodities or I would say financial uh, debt swap ratios etc etc and you have future trading and, and future uh, what do you call it? futuristic uh, virtually betting I mean that was all uh, reduced to in the international financial markets and that intertwining made the entire financial system collapse. How did capitalism try to get out of it? Giving huge humongous bailout packages United States alone, it is estimated, the Senate hearings are still going on. How much have they spent in bailing out the Wall Street giants? That year in 2009, they said they spent about 12.5 trillion dollars. When the GDP of the USA in that year was 12 trillion dollars. There was more than that to revive these financial giants because international finance capital is the leader of global capitalism today. If financial institution collapse, capitalism itself will implode. You have to save them. You save them, but then your corporate insolvencies of the financial companies converted them into sovereign insolvencies of the governments. <coughs> United States could get away because the greenback is the global, what do you call it, passport in terms of currency. They can go on printing that and nobody can question that. It's the most indebted country in the world today. United States of America. And, but they, they can get away with it, but other countries started imploding. When they started imploding, what was the answer? The latest uh, phase that you are going through? That the governments are imploding because of their own bankruptcies. Spain, Portugal, Greece, Iceland. I mean, all of them are today having a GDP that is much more, I mean, having a debt ratio that is much, much larger than their GDPs. Now, how do they manage? austerity measures, reduce governmental expenditures. And if you reduce governmental expenditures, all social services, education, health, public transport, if everything is, is, is going to be abandoned by the government, then the burdens on the working people mount further. You talk of the eight-hour eight week, today in every one of these Western countries, your travel time to reach the work is not, connect, not counted as your work. And then your 8 hours converts into 10 to 12 to 14. And India today, I mean the permanent worker is being replaced by the casual, by the contract, or by the, I mean whatever terms you have. And our government today has brought in a new law through an ordinance 
which says fixed fixed term employment. That is no permanency. Therefore, no gratuity, no housing, no medical expenditure, nothing of that nature. So, reduction of these costs, imposing greater burdens on the working people, vast majority, the purchasing power shrinks even further. After five phases of coming out of this crisis, you are creating a situation where you are likely to see a much worse crisis in the offing. And I can say that for sure because the banks today are sitting, those very banks that imploded, they are sitting with reserves that are four times larger than they had in 2008 when they imploded. Why is this not being taken out of the banks? Because there is no avenues to invest. If you invest, you produce. If you produce, somebody has to buy. People don't have money to buy. Then what do you do? Speculate. Since yesterday went up by 128 points, everybody is happy in, in India. What has it got to do with the actual fundamentals of your economy? Now that is it, a bubble. Cre keep creating these bubbles and start living on it. We are on the verge of another crisis. And that is what people are seeing. That's what they are saying. These are not faults within the system, but the system itself is faulty. That is the slogan at Wall Street today. So therefore, the whole why Marx is coming part of, of this is that you have as a result neoliberalism itself in a crisis today. There is a political churning in the world and as a result of that there is a political rightward shift. Donald Trump's victory itself is a classic example of the rightward shift. A person who probably never shook hands with any working class person in his life. Some of you may have fleet of cars, he has a fleet of planes. Uh, I mean, and then he goes around and he becomes the darling of the American working class, the white American working class, saying that I'll restore back the American dream. How? Get rid of the migrant people. No visas for Asians coming in. No relocation of production facilities of the American firms in other countries. And therefore, I'll try and insulate America and try and do the trade wars, which he's now been forced to withdraw because of China's uh, threat of retaliation. But that will not last for long. I mean, he's got to do something of that sort. So there's a rightward political shift. Marie Le Pen in France, the alternative for Deutschland in Germany. The neo fascist right wing forces rise. India is also part of that phenomenon of the political rightward shift of what we are now witnessing. And that political rightward shift is why the popular discontent that is growing should not be marshaled by the left or the progressive forces towards any revolutionary government. So Macron will come saying to defeat the right wing, Marie Le Pen, 28% of the French electorate did not vote, saying that we don't want to choose between a neo-fascist and a financial banker. And the, that financial banker comes with economic policies and a package to promote neoliberalism further. Donald Trump will promote neoliberalism further. So political right is the response to stop the popular, uh, I mean, popular discontent that is growing, turning into any progressive or a left or a revolutionary character. There are resistances to it. We have the Nicaraguan ambassador here. They are battling on the streets of Nicaragua with the American intervention. So because they had an alternative economic uh, model to the neoliberal model. You have seen what's happened in all the countries in Latin America. So there's a political fight that is on. A political fight between the political right and the political left. You saw the Celsia in Greece that imploded under home finance uh, capital and the German central bank, of course. Now, this is leading to a lot more rupture situations in the world. With Trump walking out of the Iran deal now, and all other five countries, Western, I mean, the advanced countries, all of them saying now they'll work with Russia and China. And the government will be able to explain further what are the strategic implications of this to the world. Uh, I, mean, I mean, what will happen to it? And then I'm coming to, when I come to Asia, you're, you're supposed to have a summit meeting after all, and everybody said about DPRK. 
the now the summit meeting in Singapore between Donald Trump and the DPRK leader? No, I don't know. I'm honestly, I now my suspicion is it may not happen now after Trump's walkout of this Iran thing. Because the talk is that who can trust him? What he'll agree today will go away. So I don't know. I'm sure all of you are also getting these uh, WhatsApp jokes. Um, and though the commander told you to switch off your phones, but <laughs> one of the jokes that was going doing around was the following: Is that somebody asked the U.S. Uh, president, saying that why did you attack uh, Iraq and occupy Iraq and destroy it virtually? He said we convinced the world that they have weapons of mass destruction, but they did not. That doesn't matter. But we convinced them and we attacked. So what are you doing with Syria? The same. We are telling them they have weapons of mass destruction, we are attacking them, we will continue to attack. We may do it with Iran also. But then the question is, why have you not done it in North, America, in North Korea? Then he says, are you mad? They actually have wars of mass destruction. <laughs> they actually have weapons of mass destruction. So, so th th this sort of way, I mean, I mean the world that is being created, is that one way of getting out of this global uh, economic crisis is to impose greater burdens and intensify exploitation further. That is creating this political uh, battle between the political right and the left, left progressive, etc. You have various formations coming up, like the Podomos in, in Spain. You have uh, various other groupings that are coming up, where the communists, the left and the progressive forces are coming in as an alternative to the neoliberal uh, model that is being propagated by international finance capital. In, the, in this political battle, that is where the relevance of Marxism, I think, is an, is gaining, gaining resilience because in the London, city of London, the okay, that's where Marx spent most of his time, that's where he did all his, uh, much of his work, and that's where he's contributed, with 200 years after his birth. You go there in, in the University of London at Soas, in the, in the major hall that they have there, you have the hall full overflowing with people coming back and talking of Marxism is the force to change the world today. And you have these bands, which I am still wearing, I think, which says Marx 200, <laughs> I mean, which were actually being distributed all over London on, on, the, on the 5th of May. I mean, it is not something of where an emotional bonding that with Marxism, or some say that when I was young, I was a Marxist, when I'm old, I'm wiser, I'm not. And people like me never get old, so therefore we are not wiser. <laughs> so, but, but the, the, the question is that it is because of its scientific analysis and basis that is actually unfolding and showing us what is happening. So it is in this background, Asia and India are part of this world. This is a global battle that is now today taking place on how this sort of an exploitation which the Commodore has said, 1% of the world population having 82% of the world's wealth, 82, right? In, in India, in India it is 73 percent, in India. In the world in 2017, let me put the record straight, the world in India in 2017 according to the Oxfam, 1 percent of the world's population control 82% of the additional wealth generated in 2017. 1% <coughs> of India's population controls 73% of the wealth generated in India in 2017. This is the level of your economic inequality. This cannot sustain further without intensifying exploitation as I tried to explain. And therefore, the, 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 the question before humanity is, are we going to have any relief from this? Any reversal of this? Or will the whole system will implode? And that implosion is likely to happen because in desperation to control the situation and overcome the crisis, one is the political rightwardship and the political battle that is taking place in the world. The other one is the hegemonic drive. Hegemonic drive of the only superpower left in the world who want to convert the world into a unipolar world under its hegemonic leadership, that is the United States of A. Now, if that is happening, what is that, that meaning of those interventions? 
Trump walking out of this Iran uh, deal, Israel bombing already, the US-Israel axis, Control over the oil resources and the resources in the Middle East, or what is called, I mean, what is, should be called West Asia. In West Asia, is important because the way, one way to get out of this crisis and maintain the levels of profit maximization is to increasingly control on monopolized world's resources. Oil is the most important one at the moment. Venezuela, I target. Russia, I target. <coughs> West Asia I target because of the oil, uh, oil riches that they have or the deposits that they have to control them. Interventions and elsewhere in the world is to price open the domestic economies like it is being done now with Walmart taking over Flipkart virtually. Retail trade in India, all of us fought. In parliament, outside parliament, we went to jail and I had to carry Mr. Mulayam Singh Yadav who was very frail into, into the Parliament Street Police Station in protest against uh, FDI in uh, retail trade. Now with this and with demonetization and GST, the e-commerce taking over your retail trade, your GST ruining your um, MCMEs in India, medium and small scale and micro industries, and that entire area, they contribute nearly 50% of our GDP, 60% of your non agricultural employment. That whole area of profit maximization now moving to big capital, Indian or foreign. So the impact of this crisis is to price open our economy, control our resources, not only ours, every country in the world, but we're concerned about our country. I mean, control over that, and unless that is resisted, their profit maximization increases, and your distress you size of our presence will continue to mount. Why is the Indian farmer, the Anadatta, today killing himself? Why is this distress reach such levels where the people who produce to feed you prefer to die rather than, than, than live? What are the answers? That is where I think we, this is one aspect of this imperialist uh, uh, interventions and hegemonic drive which is aimed at sustaining the levels of profit generation but also to control the world and the Commodore would know better than I would that the area of the theatre in world now in terms of these hegemonic designs is shifted to Asia and the Indian Ocean. Two thirds of the US Navy is now deployed in the Indian Ocean. The, of course, the objective is to say that containment of China is the important objective of the unipolar world that the USA wants to create. So South China Sea disputes, containment of China and every single country here being dragged into it. Matthias election today, a 92-year-old Malaysian uh, new prime minister who has been elected this morning, or late, late last night. Well, I, I'm, I'm feeling uh, upset because he's beaten Comrade B.S. Achutanandan's record. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought, but Achutanandan is still an elected uh, MLA giver. But, but it's come back. What was the main concern? Look at any analysis of that election result. It talks about, okay, corruption of the earlier regime, etc., etc., all the issues, but underlying everything else is what? Economic issues were the main concern of the people who went out to vote. If the ASEAN Tigers, so many people coming into the hall ask me, we would like to know how Marxism will integrate India with the ASEAN Tigers. The ASEAN Tigers are no longer Tigers. <laughs> and very unlikely they are going to replicate that experience of, of how they became the Tigers. They cannot in today's world and in this crisis. Each one of them has to look on its own and they are looking. It's not that they are not. Each one of them are looking for an independent trajectory of how to go ahead. And with the Korean Peninsula and the summit unlikely to happen, the tensions there are going to mount further. We hope not. We hope that both the South and the North, they have shown tremendous maturity in terms of coming together and meeting and all that, that that will happen. So one thing that we share with Asia, India shares with the rest of the Asian countries is the question of 
such interventions and being drawn into the global geopolitical strategy of the United States of America in order to establish its hegemony and whether that is in the interest of each one of the individual countries is the issue. And that is why how to, how to fight that again as a political force Marxism is the basis on which that political opposition to that will, will come in. You take our neighboring countries, particularly the subcontinent, in addition to this in what I would call, you have been used interventions or global strategic interventions of the United States of America. The other factor and the danger that is there in the among the Asian countries is the growth of fundamentalism. Look at Bangladesh, look at Pakistan, classic case. Look at assets in India, look at Sri Lanka, where now it's no longer the Sinhala uh, and uh, the Tamil issue, but it is now the Sinhala and the Muslim issue. And the recent riots that have been happening. Look at Myanmar, look at the state of the Rohingyas, that what is happening there. The rise of fundamentalism as a method to maintain the political control of the neoliberal order. That is the other danger that you will have to fight and that danger, if you look at it, what is happening in India today, that context. Why I would say that the relevance of Marxism, not only for us, but for all these countries, that is important. No, no, you tell me, when is my time uh, getting short? Right, uh, ten minutes more. So, the, the, therefore what I am uh, trying to, uh, uh, let's summarize what I have been trying to say so far. There is a global crisis of capitalism. The answer to the global crisis is, is not within the system anymore. That is increasingly becoming evident. So, what is the answer is the alternative to capitalism. And that is why Marxism globally is relevant and as a part of the globe and part of the world relevant for us and Asia. In addition, in Asia, the immediate concern is that of the interventions by the United States of America for its geopolitical strategy and his hegemonic desire. And the third that binds Asian countries together and for us in uh, India is this rise of fundamentalism and the need to combat that in order to ensure that there is no having additional burdens on the people that are being put apart from the economic exploitation that we are talking about in terms of social exclusivity and social exclusion. Fundamentalism in that sense attacks the unification of the social order and that is with India I think would be a classic example of that. And why is Marxism relevant today in India? Because I would say there are four challenges that are there before us in our country. One is this economic uh, exploitation that is deepening, widening inequalities, you know, the business suicides, etc., etc., that we talked about. The second is the sort of a polarization that is taking place, a communal polarization that has political spin-offs, and that communal polarization that is actually rupturing our society and rupturing the unity of our social order, our social fabric. The third is this continuous attacks on the institutions of our parliamentary democracy and a republican constitutional order. Look at what's happening in the parliament itself. A no confidence motion moved by more than 50 members of the Lok Sabha, which is impossible, you cannot not discuss it, according to our constitutional provisions, was not discussed in the last session. You know, and you, you, I mean, 10 lakh crores of rupees worth of withdrawals from the Consolidated Fund of India is passed in the parliament without one minute or one second of discussion. Parliament undermined. Judiciary, you're seeing what's happening in the Supreme Court today. You're seeing what's happening in the Election Commission. I mean, what, 10,000 false, uh, you know, electoral cards have been now found in Karnataka. With the two major parties blaming each other, saying that you have you done it, you have done it. But what is the authority that gives these cards to you? How, how, how did that happen? 
or you look at every single authority that controls your higher education in our country. What is happening to the UGC? What is happening to the universities? What are the appointments that are being made, made there? So you see a crumbling of the Republican constitutional order that is coming in and assault. I do not want to talk about my media friends because all of you here are employees. You are not the owners of your, of your institution. So uh, I mean I can't blame you. <laughs> but but the, the corporate control over the media and, and, and what is happening. Mrs. Gandhi had a declared emergency. Now it's an undeclared emergency. Now the breakdown of your constitutional order. And the fourth is of course these pressures that are being built up. I mean God forbid we are going to the way the things are moving in terms of your foreign policy. Instead of a US-Israel axis, if you end up having a US-Israel-India axis, and which is, which is how your developments are going, it will have a tremendous I mean, impact for millions of people who are working in all these countries in, in, in the Islamic world today, you know, who, I mean, whose repatriation is the backbone of our economy, I mean, who money that they keep sending back today. I mean, that is going to have a tremendous impact. So these four challenges, how, do, how can we meet them? Yes, meet them through popular struggles, fight against these economic policies, fight against that, and that's where the relevance of the left becomes important. Whether the question of the Dalit, I mean, for, for, a, for once, in the, from after many decades, you're hearing slogans like Lal, Lal Neel, Jai Bheem Lal Saram, you know, slogans that are coming, when the, the, the Dalit left uh, unity that's coming up against the atrocities of the Dalits. The private armies attacking your minorities and your Dalits. Private armies of moral policing, telling our children what to wear, what to eat, whom to befriend, how to behave. I mean, what else are these except reminiscent of your brown shirts and black shirts of Hitler and Mussolini? So this rightward shift that is happening in India today is actually, I would say, that the entire control over the education system, research institutions, etc. has got a, got a purpose. And that purpose is to replace the study of Indian history by the study of Hindu mythology. And oh, you had the new the Chief Minister of Tripura who said, oh, we had internet and wireless those days. Otherwise, how was Sanjay telling the story of Mahabharata, what was it, Rashtra? Or, or in vitro fertilization. The Prime Minister himself said this. In vitro fertilization, uh, how was Karna born? You know, artificial insemination and test tube babies and all that we had then. Indian history is a Hindu mythology. Indian philosophy, the richness of Indian philosophy, which continues, we are the cradle of civilizational advance in the sense of confluences. Confluences of civilizational advances globally. There is no philosophical trait in the world that you cannot find in India, which is not come, not impacted, not transformed, not given back to the world. With the Arab world had given back Aristotle to Europe after the Dark Ages. As someone commented, they did not give back the Aristotelian cat. They returned back an animal that the Europeans didn't know how to handle. Algebra gives you algebra. Everything else that comes uh, to, to, to the world is uh, from the invention of the zero, that is, that is our Indian contribution, which the Arabs showed, gave it to the world, but with acknowledgement that this is the contribution of the lands beyond the Indus. Now this philosophy that is there is now trying to be truncated into just Hindu theology. Now this is what leads to that inward thinking with which you cannot fight the current offensive. Let me end with this sort of a thought and explaining this point. Before coming, it's yeah, about five more minutes ago. Before just think about it. That think about the Germans in 1920s, 19, 1930s. The German people were the inheritors of the most progressive, rational, philosophical traditions of the world, of the human civilization. Hegel, the dialectical method. Marx, 
took up on that. And English political economy and <coughs> social integrated that to give us Marxism and develop it further. That most rational philosophy of the world, the most progressive of that, the traditions of Hegel, people who were who grew up in those traditions, people who were taught those philosophies, who internalized those philosophies, how did they end up internalizing Hitler, Nazism and fascism? Think about this. This is an important question that many of you will have to answer and try to answer. The only thing I come close to is a monumental work by George Lukács, which is called The Destruction of Reason. He said, fascism succeeded in Italy and Germany, particularly in Germany, because what was destroyed was reason, the assault on reason, irrationality taking over rationality, unreason taking over reason. And it is that assault on reason that assault of irrationality on rationality today, that is today permitting this dehumanization of our society. Eight-year-old girl raped and killed in Katwa, and the people who are to defend such things, that is the lawyers actually coming in defense of the criminals. I mean, this dehumanization that is taking place in our country today, the only way you can explain is that there is this tremendous assault on reason and rationality that is being conducted. And if you want to face this reason, I mean, this irrationality and this unreason, then the only way it has to be is through the battle of ideas and that is where the relevance of Marxism comes back. It is to re-establish the supremacy of rationality, re-establish the supremacy of reason and defeat these assaults of irrationality and unreason that are happening in India today. I'll give you innumerable examples of what is happening in higher research, what's happening in education, what's happening to our universities, what is happening to people's thinking. Today nobody asks the question, was Ram actually born in that place in Ayodhya you are talking of? Nobody, I mean, it's all internalized. Everybody accepts. Yes, Ram was born there. The issue is only, according to the Supreme Court, a land dispute. Who owns that land? So the assault and reason, you just go to the dimensions to which we are going. So that has to be combated. And if that has to be combated, there I think Marxism is the most potent weapon to bring back rationality in our normal discourse, to bring back reason in our normal discourse. And this is important and that is why it is the battle of ideas, as I began trying to say, and that battle of ideas has got a lot to do with Marxism is all about, which I began by saying it, but I always end by saying this thing, that what is the irresistible attraction of Marxism not only today, but all through these 200 years, or 150 years since he's written his uh, books, the irresistible attraction lies, as Lenin had said once, in the fact that Marxism alone, among all the philosophies in the world, combines two traits. One being revolutionary, the point is not to understand the world, the point is to change it change the world, that is a social transformation revolutionary and the other one it is supremely scientific. That is the concrete analysis of concrete conditions, what I said, if conditions change, if you do not change, you are not a Marxist. And it is this combination of being a, a, an emancipation, <coughs> human liberation, emancipation and being supremely scientific, that is the attraction of Marxism. And in final analysis, this has got to do everything with the fact that we are all human. And it was Marx himself who very famously said to, in a letter to his daughter, there is nothing human that is alien to me. Nothing human is alien to you. And if you are human, you will have to battle such irrationality and unreason. And the scientific basis for battling is what Marxism provides. And I think, therefore, the relevance not only for us in India, but for every other country in Asia, 
against this strike uh, of, uh, of attacks on, on humanism, on basically human existence. One, this economic <coughs> exploitation burdens. Two, through this question of domination and hegemonism. And three, through this rise of fundamentalism and the assault on reason. All these three can only be combated and through Marxism. And that is why I think it is more relevant today than it ever was for Asia and India and in a sense also to the world and that is what is being demonstrated. So these are some of the few thoughts I wanted to share with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I thank uh, Mr. Sitaram Yechuri more formally. Some of you had indicated that you may have to leave at 8. So may I announce this as the first shuffle that those who have to leave at 8 o'clock, you may do so now so that we don't disturb the proceedings. And if you don't leave now, please remain seated till 8.20 when we will close the session. So do not leave between now and 8.20. I mean, we need some protocols for public lectures, so I'm requesting you to bear with me. And those who are standing might want to come and use some of the seats. Speakers very kindly agree to take a few questions. We have a couple of our younger colleagues with uh, mics. If the media wants to go, please exit quietly. <laughs> I, please raise your hands, I'll identify and you know try and give as much of a chance as possible. You are wishing the media to go. <laughs> <laughs> Today I sold tickets in black for Sitaram Yechuri. So, where I have sold tickets in black, I recognize them and my payment has been in cigars. <laughs> Being guilty. Bagai, you go first. Please introduce yourself, we are recording this. Yeah, Shabir Ali Khan, Shabir Ali Khan, Shabir Ali Khan. I think your mic is not on, sir. I have two questions, basically. One is you talked about the scientific basis of Marxism, the rationality and so on. But science in the Soviet Union, for instance, did not lead to any humanism as a result of which, I mean, it seems like in, in communism, it's the collective uh, power which overcomes the individual and eventually leads to loss of liberty and which is why the Soviet Union eventually collapsed. So, rationality and humanism didn't seem to go together. And secondly, what would have happened in Southeast Asia if the United States had not intervened? Would Korea, Vietnam and all these places have become Marxist or communist? And would they have adapted? You have said something about Marxism <coughs> adapting. <coughs> would they have adapted like the Chinese have? It's basically a capitalist society. So that, that would have been a final adaptation. Thank you. Just pass the mic down there. Hi, good evening. I'm Sagar. I'm a lawyer. Thank you so much for the lecture. Uh, my question was, it's very well to say that Marxism is relevant. But as you yourself mentioned, we are in a republican constitutional order. And uh, for, for the left to really bring about a change, there will have to be an electoral victory. And considering that West Bengal was lost in 2011 and then 2016 and Tripura was lost earlier this year, um, do you think that the, the relevance of Marxism can be brought in electorally in India? And if not, in, in case electoral victories are not at the horizon, then how else can uh, Marxism be relevant in, in, in India? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Ajit. Uh, I was a bit disappointed that you uh, hung the peg of Mar the relevance of Marxism using China as an example, China's achievements. You know, many people on the right actually believe that uh, ever since Mr. Rahul Gandhi uh, pointed out the suit book business for Mr. Modi, uh, India itself is a going down a path which is socialist with Indian characteristics. Why does the Indian left feel it difficult to recognize the fact that actually India is a shining example of socialism with Indian characteristics? 
Well, I'm very sorely tempted to take uh, begin from the end uh, because uh, that question was, I think, provocative enough to uh, answer first. But let me maintain the order. Of, uh, but uh, regarding the first question, sir, about science and Soviet Union and uh, the loss of liberty and uh, the other aspect that uh, you talked about. For first, let me take for first of your question. You see, the question of uh, loss of uh, liberty in the Soviet Union, the practice of socialism as implemented in the Soviet Union and the philosophy and the science of Marxism are different. If you do not, as I said, be concrete analysis of concrete conditions are not properly applied as conditions change, you do not change your analysis, you get into these problems, that's exactly what happened in the Soviet Union. And that has been the analysis of my party, way back in 1992, when we said 1991, the Soviet Union collapsed, 1992, we have said this, because we have a unique distinction in the international communist movement or the global communist parties, that for nearly a quarter of a century, the Soviet, Union's used, Soviet Union used to call us, CPIM, as adventurists, and the Chinese Communist Party would call us as revisionists. So we were neither pro-China nor pro-Soviet Union. We were, sir, Mr. Uh, Sanjeev, I'll come back to your question later. We were considered and we still consider us as pro-India. So the practice of, of uh, how socialism was constructed, how it was built, what was happened, those days, if there are faults in it, that we are on record I mean, listing out those faults. So, but that does not negate either Marxism or the socialist idea. And that is the firm conviction. That's why millions of people today are behind Marxism and the red flag fighting. The other issue on science in the Soviet Union. I I would say that one of these. I don't know if any of you have seen the film called Three Idiots. Uh, and in the Three Idiots, one of the scriptwriters was somebody who was very influenced with us. I mean, he was part of our generation. We grew up in our study classes. We used to say there used to be a. Uh, Apparently not a joke, but I don't know how much is this uh, fact or how much is fiction. That if you re recollect, the frontiers of outer space were broken by the Soviet Union. When the Sputnik was launched, Yuri Gagarin went into space. There was panic in the United States of America. They were then, in the 1950s, developing their nationwide television. John F. Kennedy, the president of the USA, had to come on a national telecast to assure the American people that by the end of the decade, we will put the man on the moon. 1961 this was. 1969, Armstrong landed on the moon. A full decade it took them. When they started developing their space program, they were telling their uh, astronauts to record what happens in zero gravity. The astronauts tried to note down but the ink won't flow, zero gravity. Today you have this uh, free flow, you know, pens that have come, the technology came in much later, the ink was not flowing. So John F. Kennedy apparently told the CIA to find out what did the Soviets do? How did the Soviets then record what was happening? So a team was sent. They went and they were uh, what, interrogating the cosmonauts and then they went to the cosmodrome and tried to find out. They came back to the President of the United States and told him, Sir, we found the answer. He said, what is the answer? He said, the Soviets use pencils. Huh? Well, there's no problem of flow of it. <laughs> and not pins because they know zero gravity. So don't say that science did not prove this. I mean, that's not correct. Even science, I mean, historically it's not correct. And, and therefore the application, I can give you many, I mean, why I said three idiots was, that this story, which I, I was familiar in my younger days to tell in my SFI study classes, was used in the script when Virus, the principal, takes out this pen and says, the only pen that works in zero gravity. And he wants to give it to the first word. I mean, this was the idea that was brought there. That's why I referred to that. So it is not correct to say there was no scientific uh, advances or development. And in fact, many of the scientific advances development that the Soviet Union initiated today are lying unattended. And that is the misfortune. 
I'm sure many of you felt the tremors last night of the earthquake. You've gone to outer space, you're crossing Pluto now, you're going to, uh, you know, un understanding what are the Jupiter's rings. But how, how, how far have you gone under, the, under our surface? How far has the human knowledge of what is happening under the surface which we think is very stable? How much do we know, sir? The only country in the world that moved in this direction and started experimenting was the Soviet Union when it existed. And what it said was, what you, they went to some 200, 300 miles. Your core of the earth is 4,250 miles. That is the center of your earth. We know nothing. The only country that was making those advances was the former Soviet Union. So don't decry them in that sense. We may have our prejudices, but but let facts speak for themselves. So this is this is not a correct assumption. Yes, sir, uh, Mr. Sagar, then a Chinese as a capitalist society. I've just quoted to you what the Chinese uh, president and the general secretary of the Communist Party of China says. That is a cast iron proof of Marxism. Now, the general understanding is China is developing, China has become number two economic power in the world and therefore it's not communist. If you're communist, if you're socialist, how can you develop? That is the prejudice. If you're developing, then you're capitalist. This is the very, very common misconceived prejudice. And very soon, the the, the Communist Party of China, which itself talks about Marxism and Communism and saying it's the caste iron proof of Marxism. I mean, if that, if, if they're all talking lies for you and me, I don't know, but uh, they'll be more uh, acceptable in the world when they say they're not Marxists. But they're risking saying they're Marxists and saying it's the caste iron proof of Marxism. And then demonstrating to the world what can, what can be done with the concrete analysis of concrete conditions and the conditions of China, how they are implementing that. So that is not a, I mean that I think is more of a presumption that if you are a developing economy, you must be capitalist, you cannot be a socialist or a communist. I mean, you know, you want to be. Mr. Sagar, the lawyer talked about uh, the question of uh, the electoral devices and saying that the republican order of our country is essentially on the basis of elections. Correct? I agree with you. I'm not discounting the question of importance of election. But I'd like to also, yes, 35 years, seven successive elections we won in Bengal. Is there any other party that's won seven successive elections anywhere in our country? Ask that question, no? How did we win that? But your question is, how did we lose that? I tell you, with the long, big analysis that we've done, it is there on record. And, and why, why that happened. And also remember, both in Tripura this time, 25 years, 35 years in Bengal, 34 years in Bengal. Why? You, we are talking of a democracy. 80% or more of the people who voted then in Bengal when we lost, and now in Tripura when we lost, were those who were born and grew up to become voters after the left wing government came. Your generation. Every time you know you got your right to vote, your father says that my grandfather, since he started voting, it was the left wing government. Even I am voting left wing government. Is this democracy? There should be a change of government to know. So that urge for change is a democratic urge. That we then, yes, we have to overcome that, we have, we, have to, uh, we have to do that. But you understand the circumstances in which happened. The other important thing, please understand. Today, if at all there is any ideological, organizational or a challenge through popular struggles and movements against what is happening in our country and this assault on reason and irrationality we talked about, it is the left that is at the forefront. So attacking, targeting the left and reducing the strength of the left is important, like Prime Minister Modi himself said. When somebody said, why are you talking so much tom topping about Tripura's victory? Tripura sends only two MPs to the Lok Sabha. So what is so big, great about the Tripura? He says Tripura's victory is not only in terms of an electoral victory, it's an ideological victory that we defeated the CPI. 
in this battle of ideas that we are talking about, that is where the left's importance comes. 112 of your Lok Sabha members today, giving BJP that uh, majority, were all former members of the Congress. Which is the ideological, you know, uh, the opposition to what is happening in our country today, the assault and reason and irrationality? That it comes from the left. So we are the target. We are the target, that is why the, these targets of attacks that are going on and you require the Supreme Court of India today to say, to tell West Bengal where, what, how many is on, 38% of the seats, etc. Nobody could file the nominations in the local body. The Supreme Court gave another date on July 3rd or something and said till then you will not announce these results uncontested. How does that happen? Through violence, through terror, through the unleashing of that. Yes, we are the brunt of it. But in a Republican order, remember, don't measure the importance or the strength of any political party only on the basis of electoral strength. That is very important. I agree. The other parameter is on the basis of the struggles and the popular movements and the issues that are taken up and through the struggles to pose the agenda before the nation. If today, on before the nation, if the question of giving our farmers a minimum support price that one and a half times the production cost, giving our farmers the right to sell at the minimum support price, today the Food Corporation of India is not buying, even if you announce the price. Who raises this, these issues? And not only raising them in parliament, who raises them through struggles among the people? What was this long march of the peasantry to Mumbai recently? What was that one-time loan waiver? Who brings up this question? That we only thought we knew Narendra Modi, but you also have Lalit Modi and Nirav Modi and God knows how many more Modis will come into the fray. I mean, who looted and, and go on. You can, you can, uh, you know, what you call, <laughs> give relief through their loans that they have taken from your nationalized banks. 2.54 lakh crores is the NPAs that have been written off. But to give your farmers in the country one time loan waiver so that they can survive and don't commit suicide, which costs over 1.20 lakh crores, you say no. Who brings out these issues before the country's agenda where the BJP state governments today, at least on paper, have to say, yes, we'll give loan, loan waiver? Who brings out on the, on the paper that the, the changing of your labor laws in the country? which they have been talking for decades through this neoliberal uh, last two decades. But why did that still not happen? Why do they have to do it surreptitiously? <coughs> through the new law I was telling you, fixed term employment, etc. That's because of the strength of your working class movement. So therefore, the importance of a, a movement and a party and the, the growth is to be measured by both. When the BJP was two members of parliament, Adwani's Ratyatra created enough mayhem in the country for them to come back as, as a single largest party in the next elections. So the relevance lies in a combination of both. I'm not discounting any two things, but it lies in a combination of both. Yes, sir, Mr. Sanjeev's question, if I... Yes, please, Sanjeev's question about the India of course, I want, I want to take it on. India was, I mean, in the sense, socialism with Indian characteristics is what the CPM is talking about. What do we mean by socialism in India? The one whole section is in our party Congress resolution, but what do, what do we mean by that? What India has today is socialism in the preamble of our constitution, but a neoliberal capitalist order in practice. And that is our grounds. And that is our whole battle with the Indian ruling classes. <coughs> that socialist rhetoric, capitalist practice. Public sector, commanding heights of the Indian, uh, uh, Indian industry, Indian economy. Public sector was created for whom? You and I believe that it was created for the public. But public sector was created at a time who, who actually gave the first blueprint for a public sector? 
1944, it is called the Bombay Plan, drawn up by the ten biggest industrialists of British India. Tata, Birla, Mahatal, etc., etc., etc. They drew up that plan. It was a ten-year plan, not a five-year plan. And they tell Nehru, the Indian capitalist class does not have resources to, build, to invest in infrastructural products, projects. Is the job of the government. And where does the government get the money from? From the taxes from the people. That money is used to build your steel factories, to build your cement factories, to build your fertilizer factories, to build your infrastructure. Provide that infrastructure for private capitalist development. So, but today we defend public sector which is a bulwark against foreign capital coming and taking over our economy. So the point is that India has never been a socialist country. I mean, if it was a socialist country, I wouldn't be here where I am. I will be I mean, in, the, in the government, in the parliament house, in the Rashtrapati Bhavan. Uh, that, 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 that would be that would be socialist India. I want to thank all of you for being with us at this point because I didn't want an awkward situation where we have a lot of people with Sanji as well, closing it here. I think a couple of minutes, those who want to leave, you can sit down for two minutes and we'll close the session more formally. I want to thank the audience. When we started, I requested all of you to ensure that no phones rang and not a phone rang, so I really want to acknowledge your, shall we say, compliance with the request. And I do want to thank our speaker. This is a very rich lecture, if I may say so. For those of you who could not ask your questions, perhaps Mr. Yachuri will stay back for another 10 minutes at best. And the younger members of the audience who want to speak for himself, we have 10 minutes. Maybe they can say hello. But I just want to say, those of you who could not ask questions, make your comments, we have one option, which we always announce here, that both the Habitat and the Society for Policy Studies have a fairly active website. So if you want to make a comment, not agree with Mr. Yechuri, you can say it between 500 to 800 words. And we have two of our colleagues here, Sachin is here, Lakshmi is there from the Society for Policy Studies. Leave your cards, leave your emails, give your comments. I try and prevail upon Mr. Yechuri. Yeah, most of We will try and get a response, you know, from him. But I want to leave two thoughts. I thought he made a very important statement today, both in the course of his lecture and in the question answers that he was sort of responding to. We spoke about Marx and inequality. Much of it seemed to do with capitalism, the way in which the worker was being exploited, oppressed and so on. And I think Mr. Sanjeev Anwar, you drew attention to some of the contradictions within India when we talk about Marx and Potter over Marx. And when I heard Mr. Yechuri and he was talking to us about what is happening in the country over the last few years, it seemed I'm a security analyst. And like the blind men and the elephant, perhaps I'm guilty of looking at much of what is happening now and the whole Marxist kind of, shall we say, influence through the perspective of security. And in response to some of the questions asked, I think more than blaming Marx, we have to perhaps ponder over what the politician did to Marx. So therefore, I make bold to suggest that if we look at the excesses of the Soviet Union, millions died by the way, let's not forget that in the Gulags and elsewhere. It was a kind of distillate of Leninism, if you would call it that, and what that did to the Soviet Union. In the case of China, 30 million people more died. Perhaps we would attribute it to the interpretation that we now refer to as Maoism. But clearly, for a whole century or more, you had Marxism influencing the security domain, influencing the strategic domain. The whole Cold War could be interpreted under the filter of what Marxism did in terms of the US led West and the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact. As an analyst, I was thinking when Mr. Yechuti was speaking that are we now moving into a world across the globe where the relevance of Marx will be in the internal security of states and societies? That we are moving towards the equivalent of unequal citizenship. We are in a situation today where we spoke about the rich and the poor, we spoke about the powerful and the weak. But even in a democracy like India, is our politics moving towards a certain, shall we say, differential in citizenship? If that is true, and I hope it is not true, 
we are going to have one of the most complex internal security situations in India. If you recall, Mr. Yachuri spoke about the private armies, the militias. This is a global phenomenon, by the way. It's called the PSC, the private security contractor. We see this in Afghanistan even as we speak. But it struck me that I think Mr. Yachuri has touched upon a very important aspect that are our politics moving towards unequal citizenship? In which case, sir, I think, again, <coughs> I'm taking a liberty with him because not only is he a person of great political sagacity, I think we need some voices in this country to raise these issues. <coughs> and I think that perhaps would be the relevance of Marx, that those of you who have been to the UK and have had occasion to visit the monument in Highgate, there is this huge monument and the inscription reads workers of all lands unite and below that this is the advocacy of Marx and this has been again extrapolated where the quotation reads philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways the point however is to change it and I think the politician in the last hundred years has distorted Marx and allowed interpretations, including India, where I think the citizen has fell head down, whether it's West Bengal or Kerala, that we need to reflect, review, and ponder again about what is the essence that we need to take. So there's nothing. We at least come back to some of the constitutional principles which relate to our citizenship and the way in which I think we perceive and understand both the constitution and the democracy. That so on that note, I want to thank you for giving us so much, you know, I would say material to think about. And thanks to all of you, the I Habitat Center in particular, Mr. Dundon, sir, thank you and your team for your support.